So you don't have to do that, but it helps. You know, I've always said that in this church, if we're, the Lord's called us to make disciples, that means a learner of Christ. Amen. Amen. And in order to learn Christ, you got to study. Praise God. And so sometimes we got homework. Amen. But look, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Look at this. We're going to do a review. How you like that? <laughs> Amen. So we're going to slow this bad boy down a little bit. And one of the first things that I want to remind you a little bit about what we talked about last week, that the word giants in Genesis chapter six is actually translated from the Hebrew word Nephilim. And that word actually means one of the ideas behind it is the fallen one. Okay, so that's one of the things I want you to see. And the next thing I want you to see is that these fallen ones are actually a hybrid mix. We talked about that. Some of my, my handwriting is not that great, but they're a hybrid mix of angels and humans. We discussed that a little bit last week when we talked about the fact, well, how could such a thing be? And we talked about the fact that, who knows, maybe some kind of a biotechnological thing that was going on way back in ancient days. I didn't get into this because I really want to try not to go on too many rabbit trails. But it, it, once again, have you ever noticed the pyramids that are around the world? If you just start doing research on pyramids, the pyramids of Giza, for instance, and how they're completely lined up with the Orion Belt and all this kind of stuff. Plus, there's a particular pyramid that the Mayan Indians built, which was many, many thousands of years years ago and every year at the solstice when the sun comes up the shadow goes up the way this thing was made and it's got two snake heads on each end and it actually climbs up the steps of this pyramid to where it makes it the, 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 the shadow connects and it only happens twice a year at the solstice what I'm trying to say is how in the world ancient man in some jungle somewhere learned mathematics of such a sort okay you just saying oh they were just good at math okay if you say so I don't really have all the answers to that, but what I'm trying to say is, is that there's a lot of physical evidence on the earth that kind of like goes along with this. And again, you have to want to even get into it to begin with. But the reason that I even look into this is because it's throughout the word of God. So there, there's a hybrid mix right here. We talked about the fact that these things become, listen, when a Nephilim dies, it becomes a disembodied spirit. Once that happens, this is where we get the concept of demon from, all right? So what I want to make this point clear right here, as a matter of fact, that's something that's probably important enough, I think, to underline, is that a disembodied spirit is where demon spirits come from. I think it's important for us to understand some of these things having to do with the Bible because what we're doing is we're building on this. As we move forward and even like month, maybe two, three months away, we're in the book of Revelation and you start seeing the spirit of Jezebel. And I'm trying to talk to you about Revelation 17. And we go back here in about a week or two and we talk about the literal Jezebel and how the Lord referenced Jezebel and the spirit of Antichrist. Now we're understanding all this stuff starts from these forces of evil. And so there's a point and a purpose to all of this. So these spirits, one thing I'll tell you, they used to be in a body used to be in a body, used to have a body. And then after they died, we're gonna cover a couple of, couple of different stories tonight. One of them's gonna come out of Numbers 13, one of them's gonna come out of 1 Samuel 17. And in one of those stories, one of these Nephilim died. And so whenever these Nephilim die, again, this is whenever their spirits released from their physical body that they had, but then now they're demon spirits, but they used to have a body. So now in the New Testament, when we read in the Gospels, when we read in other parts of the New Testament, they're looking for a body. Hence the concept of possession. Does that make sense? I mentioned some of this last week whenever I talked about angels and the fact that typically an angel has its own kind of body. I don't want to go back to all that. Uh, some kind of a transmorphing, transmutation body because Hebrews 13, 2 says that whenever you entertain strangers be, strangers, be careful for some have entertained angels unaware. Yep. And, and, you know, then, and then I used another example to describe that very thing, right? So one of, one of the, another thing I would like to tell you is, is that these, these uh, demon spirits, they, um, they, they, in the Old Testament, they were, and still are today, they're worshipped as gods. So, in the, before they were disembodied, and before they became demon spirits, and now, guess what? Yes, sir? Sorry to interrupt. I've got to ask. No, it's a great question. Do it. In, in Hebrews, on that uh, thing about angels, 
Uh -huh. Does that fall in hand heaven? Well, that's what that's a great question. And you know what? As a matter of fact, I want to reserve at the end. I'm going to try to hustle up to where I give y'all some time because I want to encourage questions. And, but I, I'm very appreciative that he asked that question. And to be honest with you, there's nothing in that particular verse of Scripture right there that can tell us whether or not they are fallen or whether they're good angels. Now, in that context, the Apostle Paul is talking about good angels, expectedly, right? Because he's saying to people, because you're not going to entertain a fallen angel, or at least you would hope not in your house if you knew that. You understand what I'm getting at. But what I will say is this, that that is a... A question that other people have asked me whenever I'm talking about this. They're like, well, wait, those are good angels. I get it, ma'am. I get it, sir. But the reality of it is, is this. And you're not saying that, but I'm telling you what they said. The reality of it is this, is that the Bible doesn't say that fallen angels can't do the same thing. Yeah. The Bible, as a matter of fact, what do we think happened in the garden? Yeah. Whenever Satan, he utilized the body of a serpent. So he... And he showed up in the form of a serpent. And it wasn't that he's truly, yes, he's a serpent, but he's also a dragon. Okay. And so the point being is, is that as a, as a serpent, he's a deceiver. As a dragon, he's a destroyer. But, but one of the, so what I'll say is, is that I believe that these things can literally, you know, I don't necessarily want to do it because I should have taken a picture before to where I could do it. I don't want to just get on here and start trying to Google stuff and take up a bunch of time to show you a picture. But I did, I did make a point last week and I mentioned it. And so since the question came, I'm going to go ahead and try to answer it the best way I know how. Again, I'm looking for, sometimes I look for extra biblical evidence to make the point that I'm seeing in the scriptures, right? Mm -hmm. And if it lines up, okay, one of the things that I found and I, and I mentioned it in the book that I wrote because I was just amazed by it. This guy, Alistair Crowley. Okay, I'm not here to preach on Aleister Crowley, but I'm here to make a point. Aleister Crowley was a very wicked man. And Aleister Crowley had a huge influence on the America that we see today. Right? It's way too much information for me to sit here and start regurgitating all this. But you just, you get, to some extent, you can go home and you can do your own research and get back and ask me questions as we go. But one of the things that I tried to explain was, was that he claimed that he got great, deep, dark secrets in Revelation from a particular entity. He, he called it an angel. When he went to the pyramids at Giza. In Egypt. That's actually where he had his honeymoon. With one of his wives. And when he was over there. He said he had an encounter with this entity. And if I'm not mistaken. The name of the entity. I can't remember if it was Lamb. I'm getting them confused. Or Iwas. A-I-W-A-S-S. -A -S. And he drew a picture of what this entity looked like. And it was a great alien. So my point is in that I've heard other representations where people say they're having encounters with, the, with things that are calling themselves alien. And actually in one situation, again, you can't prove some of this stuff because it's the testimony of people. But in the testimony of people, if it lines up with other things that connect to scripture and it makes sense, then I'm like, I kind of like go with it a little bit here. And one of the things was that this... The, the, an alien showed up and is talking to this person and the guy says is this what y'all look like and the and the entity tells him you don't you can't handle what we look like mm -hmm. and so they're, they're presenting themselves in a particular way what i'm trying to tell you is is that there's not life on some other planet out there Amen. that that they're going to just show up one day and i'm not even saying that they even got whatever all i'm trying to tell you is is that there's some weird stuff out there i believe that but again, the, I'm telling you what I believe is that both good angels and fallen angels can transmute, transmorph, take upon themselves the form of a human body. And, um, you know, how does that look? How, I don't even know how that looks. I mean, I, I, again, I'm, I'm going a little deep right here. <laughs> but for instance, if, when we get into the book of Revelation and we get into the fact that, you know, there's a spirit of Antichrist. Right? The, John says it. That there's a spirit of Antichrist. That there's been many Antichrists. And ultimately we know in the word of God that there will be a Antichrist. There will be a fulfillment of the person 
of Antichrist. We're going to get into the scriptures moving forward where we're going to point out some types and shadows. Goliath, I believe, is a type of the Antichrist. And we're going to look at it here in a little bit as we, as we move forward. But what does it look? It tells us that the Antichrist is going to die from a mortal head wound. Now, there's a lot of different interpretations of that. But it makes perfect sense that the enemy would try to counterfeit what's already happened in Jesus. What did Jesus? Right. Jesus died on the cross and he resurrected from the dead. And so it makes perfect sense that there would be some type of a faux counterfeit resurrection to manipulate the minds and the hearts of people that are upon the earth whenever all this goes down. Yep. Right? And so the question is, how will that be done? There's a lot of different ways it could be done. I think even technologically. Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm not trying to be weird on you. I'm just telling you to shoot straight. 1985, they cloned Dolly. Yep. 1985, they cloned a sheep. And then they say, oh, but we would never clone a human being because that would just be, come, come on, man. Right. Come on, dude. I don't trust a dumb old word that comes out of y'all's mouth. Whoever that personal plural pronoun refers to when I say y'all and they, it, it is what it is. I don't trust nothing that's coming out of people's mouths because if you could clone a sheep in 1985, I'm sorry. I believe by now you could probably clone a human being. Are you doing it? I'm not saying you are because I... It's above my pay grade. But what I will say is this. It could be a clone. Yeah. A faux counterfeit resurrection could very well be a clone. Or it could just be shape shift. Like after he dies, Satan himself. But the word of God says that he, Satan himself will possess the Antichrist. Just like he possessed Judas. Alright? So, I know that was a long version of an answer. And I don't know that I completely answered it. I believe that the answer is yes. I believe, but I can't... I, I, I've scoured the Bible, and I don't can't think off the top of my head where I have biblical proof that fallen angels also can transmute, transmorph into some other humanoid-looking creature, a human creature, or some other an of the animal kingdom. I don't have any proof for that, but that's what I believe. Amen. All right. So they will worship as gods. Now, what I do believe is between fallen angels. Because, listen, some people claim the Statue of Liberty that came from the Masons in France. I'm not getting into all that. But some people are saying that that is actually a, re a, a, a representation of Lucifer himself. Some people swear by it. Can you prove it? No, you can't. But what I am trying to say is this. Is that between fallen angels and demon spirits that used to be, I believe, according to the word of God, worshipped as gods. And listen, there's a lot of information in the Bible about we don't even have time to exhaust that. Where they were worshiping these things as gods. Demon spirits as gods. Worshiping angels as gods. And then even after, and let's just say this story is right. But I'm telling you, they're disembodied. And now they're seeking some kind of a body to inhabit. And that's where we get the concept of possession. Because demon spirits want a body to be in. They want a vessel to operate in and through. All right. But in addition to all of that, what do you think all these statues are? Statues that people worship. They're idols made by the hands of men. They had idols way back in the day. But that's what the idea is here. They're giving a physical form or visage uh, to a, an, a spiritual entity for people to be able to worship them. And, and you know, I, was, I just wanted to say that they, they were worshipped as gods. These demons and fallen angels. And they want to steal God's worship. They want to steal God's worship, you know, and that's what they want to do. And listen, I will tell you this. I mean, I, I don't want to get caught up too much in some of these things, but anything that tries to, let's, let's talk about the New Testament Christian, anything that comes into your life that stands between you and the Holy God, I'm talking, listen to me, I'm talking about it, it could be a good thing. If it takes your focus off of Jesus, and now all your focus is on that thing. It could be your job. It could be going to school. It could be, and listen, we all fall prey to it. I'm not trying to act like we all got it figured out over here. But whatever that thing is, if it has taken your eyes off the Lord and you put it on it, I call that a New Testament idol. It now obstructs your view of God. All you see is that thing and you can't see the Lord. You're having a hard time seeing uh, the, the, you know, God's will for your life because this thing is all up in your face and it's getting in the way between you and your relationship with the Lord. Listen to me. There's a danger in that. 
Because you can think that you're okay. Listen, most of the things that we're going to talk about, whenever we move forward, even in the time of Elijah, they thought they were worshiping the Lord. They thought they were still worshiping Yahweh, but they were just calling him Baal. Yeah. <laughs> That's a problem. Right. That's confusion, right? And so these things are trying to steal God's worship. Why would they do such a thing? Why, why would this happen? Look, you would have to go back to Genesis 3.15, but I'll tell you that the, that, the, that the serpent in the garden knew that what God said, this is what God told the serpent. The seed of the woman will bruise, but the idea is crush. Crush your head and you will bruise, crush your heel. Now, I just, I just got to think about those kinds of things. Again, I said it last week, but I'm going to say it again because you might not remember because I used too many words. <laughs> when, you, when I was a kid in the woods, I wasn't much of a wood guy, but I went in, and you know what I like to do? I like to kill snakes. And one of the things I learned about killing a snake is you better make sure you do something to that head. Because if you don't deal with that head, yeah, that thing can come back and bite you. So the way that you remove the authority and the power, I said the power of a snake is you crush or you deal with its head. What Jesus did at the cross, because that's what that scripture is talking about right after the fall. It's looking all the way forward to the day that Jesus, the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham, the seed of Judah, the seed of David, would be manifest in flesh, die on a cross, and destroy the power by, by crushing the head of the serpent. And that he would crush his heel. Listen, you recover from a heel crush. You don't recover from a head crush. And so, why would they do such a thing? Because the Lord told these forces of evil, the seed of the woman will crush your head and your head will, bru will bruise his heel. And now they know. Somehow, someway, God is going to bring the Redeemer through the seed of the woman, and they're trying to corrupt. No longer now a seed of woman. Now we got this weird hybrid thing going on, and it was a, dude, it was like a plague. It was like an infection. Yes, ma'am. I know this might sound silly, but is it a difference between crushing and severing the head? Well, I mean, it, this right here is really just the word it's talking about, crush. Okay. And so, no, you're right. I mean, I know whenever we really kill the snake, we cut its head off. But I know, but it can, I've heard that it can still bite you even after the head yeah. has been crushed. Yeah, well, I mean, I mean, I mean, I, there's crushing and then there's crushing. I mean, <coughs> we're, we're, we're talking about an analogy right here, but I've crushed snakes so bad that, I mean, dude, their they jaw bones cry. are just all jacked up and crushed them to they the really point where they ain't even got nothing but blood yeah. up in the, <laughs> the, <laughs> the street anymore, you know? Yeah, no, there is a difference, and I'm not trying to make fun, yeah. but I'm trying to make a point. If we're sticking to an illustration, all I'm trying to say is I have crushed and twisted my foot to the point where there was no head left. Right. And so I guess in a sense that it, the crushing took place to the point where it severed it, or at least ripped the head off. You know what I'm saying? That's the kind of crushing Jesus did at the cross. Amen? And one day we're going to experience that, but that's a good question. All right, so why would they do it? Because... They knew, and they're trying to ruin the plan of God. Now, the occult world, again, I'm not trying to spend too much time on them. The occult believes they can summon these things. And, and listen, I told you about the witch of Endor, didn't I? I told you about that story where Saul went to her. The occult world believes they can summon these demon spirits, and from them they can gain power and knowledge. All right? Listen, you know how bad this is? I'm not going to sit here and start ripping off a bunch of names, but I have watched enough evidence that I believe that there's preachers yeah. that are in big time TV on television that know this and are actually working for the other side. I'm yeah, just going to yeah. leave it like that. You do what you want with that. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, I believe that there are plants behind pulpits of huge ministries that are on television that are actually working for the devil and they're not working for the Lord at all. And I'm just telling you right now, I am convinced of and they're just dragging people in a direction that's not even anywhere close to the God. So they believe that they can gain power and knowledge. Now look, again, when you, when you think of knowledge in the garden, you know what the enemy told Eve? He said, in the day that you eat thereof, you shall not die, but instead you will know. And you will become as God. I don't really have a lot of time to really break that down, but the concept of no is describing knowledge. He's saying if you go my way, you're going to gain knowledge. You're, you're, you're not going to lose something. You're going to gain something. 
And that's always the lie of the enemy, and that's the lie of the enemy on the other side. And that where, that's where the word, I believe, that that's the concept behind the whole thing regarding the Illuminati. Listen, there's a spiritual war that exists in our life. Israel fought these things physically, and we fight these things spiritually. There was a physical, and that's what we're going to look at to, to some extent tonight, physical with Israel and spiritual with us. We are in a spiritual battle. Amen? Um, and that's one of the things that I want to talk to you about tonight. I want you to see how much conflict there was with these things in Israel's life. How much conflict, how often they had to deal with these things. And then lastly, I want to use two examples of how Israel encountered these giants before they were disembodied and how we may be able to see some similarities in the struggle that you and I face. Amen? How each and every day we face a spiritual struggle and the enemy is trying to, because it's no different. I'm here to tell you tonight that the enemy of your soul and the enemy of my soul He's, 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 a, he's a tired old, he's got, his games are tired. Like, in other words, he doesn't really reinvent the wheel. He just keeps masquerading the wheel. He makes it look right, different. Right. He's got a few different little baits in his tackle box, you know. But, but the reality of it is, is that if you start to catch on to his tricks, and I'm not trying to act right. like we're going to arrive to where we're so much more wise than the enemy that we can't fall into his traps. Don't believe that. Because he's slick. Let me tell you something. Yeah. That dude is slick. And I'm not trying to give him more credit than what he deserves. But I'm going to tell you right now, I'm also not going to sit here and not act like he is not a formidable foe. He used to be a preacher when I first got saved. And what she said was, that old toothless devil. That old toothless, he's just like a toothless lion. And I can remember thinking, man, them gums hurt somehow. <laughs> and I'm just saying that Jesus did give us victory over him. Hallelujah, when Jesus died at the cross. But I'm here to tell you right now, he is slick and he is wily. And he will try to get you caught up and jammed up in a mess. All right, so let's go ahead and let's take a look at a couple of these. Let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 3. And um, I, want you, I want you to, let's just go ahead and read some of this here. Then we turned, now this is, this is having to do under the leadership of Moses. Then we turned and went up the way to Bashan and Og. The king of Bashan. I want you to know that you might not have ever even heard of Og of Bashan. Og of Bashan is the most written about Nephilim in the whole Bible. His name occurs 23 times in the Old Testament. Goliath is probably the most popular one, but his name is only used six times. Anak, his name is used eight times. So Og of Bashan is a king that was a Nephilim. And it says that uh, Bashan came out against us, he and all his people, to battle at Edrei. The Lord said unto me, Fear him not, for I will deliver him and all his people in his land into your hand. And you shall do unto him as thou didst unto Sion, king of the Amorites. And we're going to get into some scriptures, but it looks like the Amorites were some of these giants too, which dwelt at Heshbon. So the Lord our God delivered into our hands Og also, the king of Bashan, and all his people, and we smote him, which means we, we drove him back, we, we killed him, until none was left to him remaining. And we took all his cities at that time. There was not a city which we took not from them, three score cities, sixty cities, all the region of Argob, the kingdom of God, in Bashan. All these cities were fenced with high walls, gates and bars, beside unwalled towns a great many, and we utterly destroyed them, as we did unto Sihon, king of Heshbon. Utterly, look at this. I want you to see this. Look at this. Let's go ahead and do this right here. Boom. Utterly destroying men. Women and children. Boy, I tell you what, if that's not one of those arguments that people are like, how can you serve a God that just destroys women and children? Well, hold on a second. This brings a whole new light to the story. So now what we're talking about is, is that we have a civilization where the Lord is telling his people to go in and to conquer that are now infected with this, I'm calling it an infection just because it's easy to say, are infected with this Nephilim gene that is literally
literally a plan from Satan himself to thwart the plan of God, to destroy the seed of God's people uh, so, that, so that Messiah could not theoretically be born. Because Jesus became a man so that he could pay the penalty for fallen man. He didn't come to redeem fallen angels. He didn't come to redeem half mixture hybrids. He came to die for the seed of Abraham. That's what the word of God teaches us in Hebrews chapter 2. For he became us. Because the children were partakers of flesh and blood. He became us so that he could redeem the seed of Abraham. And in the original Greek language, the idea is that he bypassed the angels. Because Jesus didn't come to die for him. Jesus came to die for the seed of Abraham. To set you and I free. Amen. And so, listen, I just want you to see that. Because if you've ever had a problem with that, <coughs> why would God allow or ask his people to destroy children? I want you to understand that this is a this is a problem. This is the works of Satan trying to destroy the plan of God. And so hopefully that at least makes a little bit of sense. I'm not saying that it's fixed it for you yet, but hopefully at least it makes a little bit of sense. He says, but all the cattle and the spoil of the cities we took for a prey to ourselves. We took at that time out of the hand of the two kings of the Amorites, the land that was on this side, Jordan, from the river of Arnon unto Mount Hermon. Listen. That Mount Hermon, we're, I want to talk to you more about that as time goes forward. But And I'm going to show you a map before the night's over of Mount, where Mount Hermon was. But there's a hotbed of occultic activity that takes place throughout the Bible. And according to the book Enoch, First Enoch, this is where these angels descended upon this Mount Hermon. And listen, when you start looking at the area of a map and you start realizing all the occultic stuff that took place... The Syrophoenician woman's daughter that was set free. The man of Gadarene. Uh, Elijah's uh, showdown with the prophets of Baal. Uh, the witch of Endor. And all of these things are taking place in this area where Mount Hermon is located. And it's all interconnected. The king of Tyre in the in book of Ezekiel that's talking about Satan himself. All of that is all up in that area. And, and, and there's something to that. But I mean, a lot of times we don't catch on because we're just moving. So moving through and not paying attention. As a matter of fact, that word Sidonians, which Herman, the Sidonians called Syrian, that, that area of Tyre and Sidon is a hotbed of occultic activity throughout the Bible. All the cities of the plain and all Gilead and all Bashan, <coughs> unto Salca and Edrei, cities of the kingdom of Og and Bashan. For only Og, king of Bashan, remained of the remnant of the giants. There you go. Behold his bedstead. Now, I've always wondered, and I can't prove this, but it's interesting. This is just a little minutia, Bible trivia. This is where I wonder if the king-sized bed came from. <laughs> right? I mean, come on. I don't understand. Look, he was of the remnant of the giants. Behold, his bedstead was a bedstead of iron. Is it not in Rabbit of the children of Ammon? Look, nine cubits was the length thereof, and four cubits the breadth of Thereof after the cubit of a man. What is a cubit? From the elbow to the fingertip of a man. Not a nephilim. Of a man. 18 inches. 1.5. If you multiply 1.5 by 9. I think it comes out to 13.5 feet long. And 6 feet wide. For one man to sleep in there. And he's saying, hey listen. Everybody's seen this man. He said, hey. Did you not see it? It's in Rabbath of the children of Ammon. You can go look at it if you want. At least back then you could. And this land which we possessed at that time from Arior, which is by the river Arnon and half Mount Gilead, the cities thereof, gave I unto the Reubenites. And he, and he goes on to say, all Bashan, the kingdom of Og, gave I unto the half tribe of Manasseh, uh, which was called the land of the giants. All right, that was the first scripture. I'm just trying to show you how the people of God were fighting and warring against these giants, right? So let's go ahead and take a look now at um, let's go ahead and take a look at Joshua chapter thirteen. Joshua thirteen verse twelve it says, "All the kingdom of Og and Bashan, which reigned in Ashtoreth and in Edrei, who remained the remnant of the giants, for these did Moses smite." 
and cast them out. Um, let's look at uh, First Samuel. I'm sorry, Second Samuel, chapter twenty-one, verses sixteen through twenty-two. And Ish Bibinah. That's a weird name, right? Let's see what that word means. His dwelling is in Nob, son of Rapha. Of the nation of the Philistine giants who attacked David in battle. Alright. So Ishbibinab, which was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear weighed 300 shekels of brass in weight, he being girded with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zariah, secured him or protected him and delivered him and smote the Philistine and killed him. Then the men of David swear unto him, saying, Thou shalt go no more out with us to battle, that thou quench not the light of Israel. In other words, we don't want you to die, King David. And it came to pass after this that there was again a battle with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibekiah the Hushathite slew Saph, which was of the sons of the giant. Look at all these giants. And there was again a battle in Gob with the Philistines where Elhanan, the son of, oh Lord, Jareb, <laughs> uh, Bethlehemite, slew the brother of Goliath, the Gittite, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. And there was yet a battle in Gath, that's a city in, in the Philistia, okay, where was a man of great stature that had on every hand six fingers and on every foot six toes, four and twenty, which means twenty-four in number, and he was also born to the giant. And when he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, the brother of David, slew him. These four were born to the giant in Gath and fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 2, verse 10. Deuteronomy 2, verse 10 says right here, The Emims dwelt there in times past, a people great and many and tall as the Anakin. All right, let's go back. Let's go backwards a little bit and let's take a look at Genesis chapter 14, verse 15. Uh, do you agree with me, even though we don't completely understand everything? And sometimes when some things are new, we're kind of like, wow, what's really going on here? And maybe even sometimes we sit in the back of the church and we wonder, why is this preacher talking about all this stuff? But let me ask you a question. If God puts this much of this in the Bible, yeah. shouldn't we be like, shouldn't we have known about this a lot longer ago? Yep. I'm just trying to ask a simple question. <laughs> shouldn't we have we known about this a whole lot longer ago? Yeah, I think we should. I, that's my personal opinion. You know, I mean, some people I've even questioned in the past. I'm like, well, maybe people aren't ready for this. Well, when is anybody really going to be ready right, for this? Right. <laughs> That's true. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Come on. Help me out here. <laughs> you know? All right. Genesis 14, 15. Now, this is talking about the time of Abraham. Whenever Abraham went to, uh, went to go deliver Lot, and he lined up with some other kings, and they fought some giants. Look at this. And he, uh, Genesis 14, 15. 15, 5, Genesis 14, 5, I'm sorry. Genesis 14, 5. And in the 14th year of Kedalamur, the kings and the kings that were with him and smote the Rephions. And it's saying that one of the, uh, it's kind of hard for you to see that unless I blow it up for you. But you see where it says, uh, Right there. Old tribe of giants. Rephim. And this is during the time frame of Abraham. And it says Rephim's in Ashtaroth, Carnium, the Zuzums in Ham. That the Zamzums, they're called Zuzums right here, were a tribe of giants. The Emums in Shava, Kiriathim, the Horites in their Mount Seir, and unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. All right, so he fought these, they fought these groups of these giants. There's another spot. Uh, it, let's take a look at, at Amos because we're talking about the Amorites. Just looking, we've read several passages that talked about the Amorites, but I want you to see this particular passage that specifically talks about them and to see what it says. Deuter uh, Amos chapter 2 verse 9 Yet 
talking about God destroyed the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of the cedars, and he was strong as the oaks, yet destroyed his fruit. Now, I, I agree that there's a good chance, this is just my personal opinion, that there's a little bit of hyperbole being used here. What I mean, it's a literary tool that, that over embellishes, but if God wants to use some over embellishment, he's allowed to, but I think that the main point that's being here is that they were at least as tall as the Anakim, and that they were there were giants in there. All right. Um, all right. Let's see here now. So let's let's look at Deuteronomy uh, chapter two. We're almost done with this part of it, and then we're going to move on to some so, to those two stories I was telling you about. Deuteronomy two verses nineteen through twenty one. And when you come near over against the children of Ammon, distress them not, nor meddle with them. For I will not give thee of the land of the children of Ammon. You may not remember who the Ammonites were, but the Ammonites were actually, it's kind of, I'm not going to get into the whole story. Well, it's a strange story. Whenever God delivered Lot and his two daughter, daughters out of Sodom, this is a perfect example of whenever you take matters in your own hands. Listen to me, child of God. You don't have to take matters into your own hands. Abraham took matters into his own hands, and he produced a child named Ishmael, and we're still dealing with the offspring of Ishmael today in the Muslim religion. They did not, listen, Muslims do not believe in the same God. It's a remake of the old moon God that was in that area. But, but people try to say that it's the same God as what Abraham served, but no, it's not. Ishmael was an offspring, and he produced that with his, through his own flesh. He made it happen. Yeah. you got to be careful that you don't go around making stuff happen. It, the Lord, sometimes the Lord's trying to say, hey, Christian, son, daughter. I'm trying to get a hold of your attention. You're going in the wrong direction. You're trying to create something. You're trying to make something. You need to stop and you need to let me speak. You need to be still and know that I am God. But sometimes we don't want to do that. And Abraham didn't want to do that. And look, these daughters, what I'm trying to tell you is when the Lord delivered Lot out of, out of Sodom, he had two daughters. They, they come up with a plan. This is their plan. I know it's, it's gross, but it is what it is. It was an incestuous plan. They, two daughters with their daddy stuck in a cave. The whole world's over now. What we're going to do? We're going to lose, lose offspring. Mama turned into a pillar of salt. Let's get daddy drunk and lie with him. I'll get him drunk tonight and lie with him, and I'll give you, he'll give us me offspring. Then you do the same thing tomorrow. That's what they did. They created the Moabites and the Ammonites. The Moabites, listen to me, that's a problem, church. Because not only is it a problem with service, but it's a problem later. Because the Moabites served a god named Chemosh. You know what Chemosh wanted people to do? Sacrifice their children to him in the fire. And the children of Israel ended up getting caught up in all that garbage later on. But here the Lord says, when you come near the children of Ammon, don't meddle with them. Because I'm not going to give you the land of, for the children of Ammon, any possession. Because I've given it to them. I've given it to Lot. That also was accounted a land of giants. Giants dwelt there in an old time. The Ammonites called them the Zamzamans. A people great and many and tall as the Anakims, but the Lord destroyed them before them, and they succeeded them and dwelt in their stead. You know one of the things I love about the Bible? The Bible does not try to sugarcoat anything. Right. The Bible tells you right. just like it is. Do you think that, you, you know these other people when they write a book, they're not about to tell you, yeah, I delivered Lot, and look what his daughters did on the next night. You know, or, you know, you, you get the point. Or David is a man after my own heart. And what do we find out? David ends up, dude, the story of David. Yeah, I know we've been there. I don't have time to go there. But what did he do? He committed premeditated murder and he laid with some other man's woman and got her impregnated and tried to cover it up and had, her mur had him murdered. Well, how can you call him a man after God's own heart? Because I'll tell you why. Because every last king after him, you know what they did? They worshiped Baal. They made altars. His own son Solomon made an altar to Chemosh, made an altar to Molech, made altars to all these false gods and all the kings after him except for David. You know, if you read the kings, what it says? He did not do this new king, whatever his name was, Manasseh, Ahab. He did not do after his father David, he did after his father Jeroboam or after his father Solomon. They did not worship the Lord. David said, I will not lift up my heart or my eyes into an idol, but I will serve the Lord my God. No matter what I'm going through, no matter what I'm facing, they might try to kill me. I might have to hide in a cave, but I will not 
lift up my eyes to an idol. And David had one heart singularly for the Lord when it comes to who he was going to worship. He was all about the presence of the Lord. He was all about worshiping God. I understand. If you never committed adultery, you probably can't. God just can't wrap my mind around that. I'll never be able to forgive nobody for that. But you did something, my friend. You've done something in your life that, that God is not pleased with. And you're probably doing something right now God's not pleased with. Lord, help us. Amen? Amen. Right, right. Lord, help set us free. Because Jesus paid a high price that we could be free. Amen? Amen? Amen. Let us get these idols out of our life. All right, let's go to Numbers 13. Now I'm going to just kind of like, uh, let's see, Numbers 13, starting in verse 17. Numbers 13. Them kids have a front, man. So look, Moses is going to send them to spy out the land. Because look, this is a time frame that the Lord has uh, brought them out of Egypt. They've been wandering in the wilderness. God wants to bring them into the land of Canaan. All right. Um, as a matter of fact, let's go ahead. Let me, let me just give me one second. I'll, I hope I'm not taking up too much time to do this. But look at this map. I want to I just stop for a second. And I want to show you a couple of things. You see, I, I can't get interactive with my map. I thought I was going to be able to. But you see that body of water at the very top up there, that blue body of water in the middle? That's the Sea of Galilee. That blue line that's coming all the way down, that's the Jordan River, and it's emptying into the Dead Sea. Everything on the left side up to where the Mediterranean, that other blue piece of water off to your left, uh, that would be actually to the west, all of that is the land of Canaan. That's what we know as Israel now, okay? So originally the name of Israel was the land of Canaan. Now look at all these, all these other spots, okay? I want you to look up at the top right, the kingdom of Og. You see that top right? Kingdom of Og. Look at under Ham right there. Go a little bit lower, Ham. The Zuzim, that we talked, we read about them, did we not? The kingdom of Sihon, the Ammonites. Look, if you go down a little bit further from the Ammonites, kind of near the Dead Sea, the Eman. You remember we read about them. All these were giants. These are like nests of giants everywhere. Look, look at, let's cross over the Jordan River. Let's go to the left. Look, written across the Anakim. If you go a little bit below that, um, towards the bottom of the page, Arba and A Anak. Anak was a name of one of those giants. Look, look at, uh, you got the, the, the Gath is where, uh, off to the left is where Goliath was from. But I want you to see this. You see that circle I drew up there? You know what that is? That's Mount Carmel. That's where Elijah had his showdown with the prophets of Baal. But I'm going to go backwards a little bit. Um, and look, you see this, where I circled this in red? That's that place, Tyre. The word of God tells us that that the king of Tyre the, it describes that Satan was using the king of Tyre as a uh, as a vessel. All right, Look, go go to the right and come down a little bit where you see that Gadara right there, where I drew that black line underneath it. I'm talking about the map on the left. That right there, you know what that is? That's the land of the Gadarenes. What, does that ring a bell? You know who the, the man of Gadara, Gadara was? That's the man that whenever Jesus showed up, he was in the tombs. He was possessed by many devils and he was cutting himself. All right? Um, look at this right here. I want, you, I want you to see this. Look up at the top right there. Uh, you can't, may not even be able to see it. You probably can't see it. It's, uh, it's the, that, that word at the very top where you see that pink and you can't see the word is Sidon. Okay? The one below, below it again is Tyre. Look at to the right right there is Mount Hermon. You remember how I told you Mount Hermon was the place where all these weird angels came down? Look, look right there below that to the left is Dan. Y'all remember anything about Dan? Dan was the most northern tribe of Israel. I know I'm telling you a lot. Let's go back and watch the video. Pause it. Write some notes. Look, the, the, Dan was the most northern tribe of Israel. Guess what? That's where Jeroboam, when the kingdom was split, put a golden calf up there. And said, this is your God that delivered you, Israel. You know why he did that? Because he didn't want them traveling to Jerusalem to worship the one true God. He wanted to hold them in bondage. He brought idolatry into the camp. And listen to me, child of God. I'm telling you right now. They got all kind of false stuff going on in the modern church. This spirit continues to live today. Trying to railroad the people of God and get their eyes off of the Lord. And they think that they worship in God. This same thing going on over here. Again, you see Mount Carmel. So I wanted you, I wanted you to see those things.
that I was that I was trying to explain to you. He said, that's the land of Canaan. And he says, get you up this way and go see what kind of a land it is. I want you to see what kind of whether they live in tents or they live in big houses, whether the land is lean or the land is fat. I want you to go check it out. All right, it was the time of the harvest. I got to kind of hustle up to get through it. And, and, and you know, he, he, look, the ch but look, this is the big thing. I want you to see the children of Anak. <laughs> so Moses says, hey, listen, I need you to send some men up to spy out the land because the Lord's telling us to go take the land. God still got the same plan today, Christian. God wants you and I to not just possess, but to take the land. He puts his spirit on the inside of you and not me. And he wants us to believe him according to his word. And he wants to use us as vessels to proclaim the truth in the land. To let other people know that there is a real God in heaven that loves them and died to set them free. The same God then is the same God today. And he was using Israel. But look at this. Sent some, sent some people in the land. Oh, but the children of Anak were there. They came to the brook Eshcol. They cut down a branch. With one cluster of grapes. And, and between, they had to carry it on one on a pole. They had to tie that thing. Two men had to carry that, that cluster of grapes. And listen, if it's hard for you to believe, just Google the biggest pumpkin recently. Google some stuff like that. See how big produce can be. All right? Uh, did you hear that a man, did, did I tell y'all the other day that a man just got swallowed by a whale? Yep. Now y'all just showed me the picture. Yep. A man literally got swallowed up by a whale. All the scientists said, that's impossible. That's a lie. Jonah can't be real. No whale could. Dude, that whale swallowed that man. Now you didn't do what you want with that. Look, you know that's just like God. You're going to sit here and call me a liar? I might wait a couple thousand years, but I'm going to get it to where you got media and I can, you can post that on Facebook, buddy. You might try to hide it, but no, no, no. They ain't going to see it. He was in his hospital bed with his thumbs up. I can't remember what he was doing. I don't know if he was fishing or whatever. He said all of a sudden it went black. And he said that he could, he could hear some stuff gurgling and all kinds of stuff going on. He was sitting in his bed. Yeah, the Lord delivered me from the mouth of the whale, baby. Isn't that something? All right. Did Jonah die? Huh? Did Jonah die? Did Jonah die? Probably so. In the belly of the whale? I mean, while he was sinking? I can't tell you for sure, <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, I mean, I wouldn't doubt it. And the Lord revived him. That would be a good type right there. Forty days. They returned from searching of the land after 40 days. We're going to get into that a little bit later. Milk and honey, that means there's a land of abundance. But look, nevertheless, so this is what I want to tell you the story. So Moses tells them, send some men into the land. Find out what it's like over there, right? And so they go. And everything's great. I mean, they got some awesome grapes, Lord. The land is awesome. But there's only one problem. There's this, the, the sons of Anak. These big old giants. And so they're going to hinder us, right? And they come back to give the, the report. And, they're, and, and, and it, it looks good, but the people are strong that dwell there. But, you see that? Nevertheless, it looks good, but nevertheless, the cities are walled. They're very great. And we saw the children of Anak there. And the Amalekites dwell there. And the Jebusites and the Amorites. And look what, look what happens. Caleb. I don't have time to, to, to explode it on you. But Caleb, his, you know what his name means? It means dog. Now, there's a couple of different ways you can look at a dog. You can look at a dog because the Jewish people looked at dogs. You know, a dog will eat its own vomit descriptive maybe of paganism because a pagan will eat anything like false doctrine and whatever the case but some there's some things that are good about a dog and one of the things that's good about a dog is that it's tenacious when you get a hold of a tenacious dog that will not let go and i'm here to tell you that that's really the idea behind his name is tenacity the name of caleb describes tenacity Somebody that's going to hold on listen caleb comes back with a report he, he steals the people he said oh shh he says, he steals the people before Moses. He said, let us go up at once and possess it. For we are well able to overcome it. But the men that went up with him said, we be not able to go up against the people. For they are stronger than we. And they brought up an evil report of the land. And, and there we, they start telling their side of the story. We saw the sons of Anak and we looked like grasshoppers. They were giants and we were grasshoppers. 
Now, what does this have to do with you today, Christian? I want to just go ahead and tell you in case I ain't got enough time to get there. The enemy wants to give you the land. The enemy wants, I'm sorry, the Lord wants to give you the land. He wants you to possess the land in victory. Why? Because he wants to receive glory out of your life. And those same giants that affronted Israel are now demon spirits and they're trying to come against you. Because they don't want you to enter the land and they don't want you to become the servants of the Lord that God has called you to be and that God has planned for your life. And so therefore they will stand there and through fear and intimidation, the enemy of your soul will try to prevent you from walking forward and possessing the land that God has for you, that God has for me, that God has for the church. I'm talking about the real church. We ain't the only church. Come on, somebody, help me out of here. But we want to be the real church, meaning we want to be in the real gospel. Right, right. Amen. And we want to follow after the Lord. Listen, every last one of you in this place, the enemy is trying to prevent you from moving into the land of victory. Is he not? What is he dealing with you about? Well, what is he trying to call, you know, to, to prevent you from entering in? He's got something going on in your life right now. And, 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 and then he tries to use it to strike fear in your heart, to make it look hopeless. Okay. It's like, man, I, I, I'm just like a little grasshopper. Look at this thing. The sons of Anak are big. How am I going to take this on? Come on. What is that, what is that son of Anak in your life? Mm-hmm. I'm here to tell you that it can it, it, It's not more powerful than the Lord. Oh, that's easy for you to say, preacher. Yeah, I get it. Sometimes it's easier than others. But I know there's a real struggle out there, my friend. Yep. But it's not bigger than the Lord. Amen. I can promise you that. <clears throat> Look at this. Going into verse four, chapter 14, the people wept that night. You know what happens, man? Listen, I was sharing something with a young lady earlier when I went and got my hair cut. And I was like, and I, I'm telling you right now, I'm going to fill that ear up. <laughs> because sometimes we got a spirit of rebellion on us. Can you get an amen in the amen. house of the Lord? Amen. We got a spirit of rebellion on us and we don't want to let go and give it over to the Lord. Right. I'm trying to help you, my friend. Amen. Mama said, just take it. I know it tastes bad, but it's good for you. Take it. Yeah. Take that medicine. Oh, it's good for you. We sometimes we got I'm talking to the preacher. Sometimes we got a spirit <laughs> of rebellion. We want, I want to do it my way and I want to do what I want to do. And you know what, Lord, if you ain't on board, then guess what? I'm, la 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 la. I'm not listening. That's a problem <laughs> because now we're causing them. We're, we're, and like the people are weeping that night because, and look what they go on to say. Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron and the whole congregation. Look what they said. Would, that's another way to say King James for I wish. Boy, how I wish. I wish to God that we had died in the land of Egypt. What? You want to die in the world? You want to die under the bondage of Pharaoh? What kind of testimony is that? Oh, how I wish we just would have died in the land of Egypt. Or I wish that God, that we would have died in this wilderness. Look what he goes on to say right here. Were it not better for us to return to Egypt? Boy, listen, there is so much theology right there, my friend. Because listen, sometimes you're going to be fighting those giants in your life, those strongholds, and they're going to tower over you, and they're going to say, you little grasshopper, you're too weak to enter into the promised land. Don't you believe that word that preacher's preaching? It'd be better for you to go back where you came from, little man. It'd be better for you to go back and, and just grab a hold of what you used to do. Whatever that was. Whatever you used to do to quiet the pain in your heart and in your life. Just go on back. Yeah. Go on back and take a little nibble. Go on and back and get you a little taste. It's going to be okay. It's not going to be that bad. No, no, no. That's a lie. You take that nibble. You take that taste. Whatever that thing is. And, and you put that. You just take a little pinch of it. Yeah. And I'm telling you right now. It ain't going to stop at a pinch, my friend. That's right. Because the enemy. You give, an, you give the enemy a little bit of a taste. And it's going to turn. It, oh, it ain't going to happen all at once. Because this is not how he rolls. Amen. He takes his time. Slick. Slithery. Serpent. And he deceives. And one, the next thing you know, you caught up in a big old mess. All right, let's go real quick to 1 Samuel 17. The Philistines were gathered together. I did, I put a little, I put a little map real quick. 
this is where they were. They were in this area right here called Soko. You see where I circled that? I think I thought I had put another kind of map in here, but maybe I didn't. All right, that's cool. That didn't really show you too much right there. But I want to, let me just kind of tell you a little bit of the story. That way we can move through it real quick. So the children of Israel are in this area called Soko, and there's a valley. It's called the Valley of Elah. And you got the children, the Philistines are on one side and the children of Israel on the other side. And the Bible says for 40 days this went on. Look, there's a whole lot of stuff going on for 40 days. Jesus was tempted 40 days. The children of Israel wandered in the wilderness for 40 days. The rains fell and for, on Noah for 40 days. Uh, we, what we just read in the last passage about 40 days and here we go for 40 days this is happening too there's a testing there's a trial the lord will allow it to happen every single time you turn around god is is desiring to prove something through these 40 days and many times you're going to find yourself in a 40 day Right. What you trying to say? I'm trying to say that when you find yourself in the midst of it, you can be, you can rest assured it's either judgment or it's a trial to, to give you the opportunity. You're going through something, but the Lord wants to bring you out victorious on the other Amen. side. And so for 40 days, this is the same thing that's happening. You just got to trust me. You can go back and read it later if you want. Every day, the Bible says that they got up and they, and they got dressed and they got in battle array. It means they got in their arrangements, got ready for war. On one side of the valley over here, and then what happens this is just how I imagine that old sleep, that old giant's been laying down, Goliath, probably got some old nasty stuff in his beard. He wakes up, and the sun's hitting him just right, and I don't know, he may be, I'll be nice, he's scratching the back of his head. And he, what he does is he looks over there across that valley, and he goes, what are we, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to fight? Send me a man. Send me a man to fight me. And if I win, then you will serve us. And if he wins, then we will serve you. And I don't even know if I can get up into that scripture, but I'm going to tell you right now. In Romans chapter 6, in the middle of Romans 6, around verse 23, it, it starts to, you might have to go up a little bit because I might be off a little bit, maybe 17. Mm -hmm. It says, did you not know that to whom you yield yourself, to whoever you yield yourself, that thing, you become its servant. Yep. You yielded your members, your, your body parts, to sometimes we yield ourselves to sin. Goliath is a perfect type of the Antichrist on one end, because look, he was six feet, he was six cubits tall, he had six pieces of armor, plus, you know, his weavers, his spearhead was six, 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 six. There's all kinds of places, but not only that, he's a representative of the devil himself. He's a representative of the forces of evil, and he's a Nephilim. And, and he's sitting there, the champion, right here, verse 4, and look, he, he was six cubits high, his name was Goliath. Send me a man, and going back to that whole servant thing. And he cried unto the armies of God, am not I a Philistine, you servants of Saul? Choose you a man for you, and let him come down to me. Servants. He wants them to be their servants. You know, the enemy wants you and I to serve him and, and, and to be bound by sin. He said, I defy the armies of Israel. They were dismayed. They were fearful. Now David, see, enter David, young David. He comes to bring cheese and nourishment to his brothers that are fighting because he's been over there in the field feeding the sheep, being a good shepherd boy, following after his daddy. He shows up on the scene, and you know what? He hears this thing. It says again, Israel is all dressed up in battle array and they're shouting the war cry. I mean, I grew up playing, you know, some little league football and stuff like that. And I can remember we get all fired up. We start slapping ourselves in the helmet. Boom, boom, boom. Ha, ha. You know, I can remember, like, I know people thought it was so weird. But I would growl at them whenever I was playing. Those were a little chunky thing. But I'd be like, stir, stir, stir. And I'm like, I was a dog. And I, I mean, I don't know. I just turned into something different when I got on the field. And, and, and I can imagine them. Like, you know, and you know what the Lord showed me one time? The Lord said, look at my church. <laughs> look at my church. All dressed up. I ain't like they're ready to go to battle. And on Sunday morning, boy, they like all ready to go to battle. I'm talking about not this church. I'm talking about other, other churches where I've been. Woohoo! We got our dance on. But then Monday, 
through Saturday, ain't got nothing about the Lord. The Philistines said, send somebody out here to fight me. Ain't nobody living for the Lord. Ain't nobody telling nobody about Jesus. They're just sitting there in bondage and they're really shaking in their shoes. And they're putting on a show and nobody's really stepping up to face what's really going on. And young David shows up and he sees all. And he's like, what in the world is going on here? Did you hear what he just said? You can't let him say that. And, and, and they bring him to Saul because he said, I'll take him out. They bring him to Saul and Saul says, you can't fight him. You're nothing but a little boy. And, 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 and the Lord, uh, Saul, David ends up telling him, he said, listen, whenever I was tending my father's sheep, uh, when I was tending my father's sheep, a, a, a lion came and a bear came. And David said, I killed that lion and that bear. And he said, this uncircumcised Philistine. Now, I know that's kind of weird, but circumcision was a is, it was the sign of the covenant that the children of Israel have with God. The point, really, that I get out of that, spiritually speaking, is why are we letting this person that doesn't even, that's not even in covenant with God have power over my life? Right. That goes for you today, my friend. The enemy of your soul, the forces of evil, will use uncircumcised Philistines in your life. I'm talking about physical people. You got to remember something. You don't battle against flesh and blood. Listen, if you don't get nothing else that I say today, I got to remind you, you're not in a battle against flesh and blood. But against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness, the forces of evil, that's what you're in battle with. Yes, they show up in a human body. And they, and they say things to you and they poke you in the eye and they hurt you, figuratively speaking. But the word of God says that's not who you're in battle with. Right. That's right. You're, you're in battle with the spirit behind that. <laughs> and David said, listen, but I want you to see this because I'm about to get into the story a little bit. When they saw the man, when they saw Goliath, what did they do? They're talking about the children of Israel. They fled from him. Yes. Mm -hmm. David spoke, which I, you know, I don't want to get into this too much, but I want to bring it to a spot. Look at this. He says, did you, did you just see this? He, and, he, and he's right there by his brother, his oldest brother. Now, boy, I wish I had time to preach this because this is so good. I'm going to preach it coming up. His oldest brother's name was Iliad. Everybody thought Iliad was the next in line. The Lord told Samuel, when you see his stature and you see what he looks like, because you're about to walk up on the most handsome man in Bethlehem right now, the son of Jesse, his oldest born, that, 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 you're going to think that he's the right one. Because Saul, the Bible says Saul was head and shoulders above everybody else. All these other nations had Nephilim for kings. And, and you're, you're about to see Eliab. I'm telling you right now, I don't look at the outward appearance. Man looks at the outward appearance. I look at the heart. And he goes down the line, passing him up. Finally, he anoints David. Now, the next chapter, when you turn the page, Eliab's on the battlefield. David shows up, and he's like, I cannot believe that y'all are allowing this giant to talk this kind of trash. And look what, it, look, what his, uh, look what his brother Eliab says right here. I know your pride. <laughs> Who do you think is really prideful right here? <laughs> Eliab just had his pride crushed. And the naughtiness of your heart. That word naughty is, listen, you know what that word naughty means? Look, boom. Let me show it to you. If I can get it open. Look at this. Bad quality. You, I, I mean, that's not what I get out of the life of David. I don't get, yeah, I know he made some mistakes, but I don't get bad quality. No, I think you're showing your own fruits here, buddy. I think you're full of pride and that your heart's the one that's bad quality. Mm -hmm. He says, therefore you've come down that you might just see the battle. And David said, what have I now done? Is there not a cause? I want to encourage the church to know that whenever you take a stand for the Lord and you begin to talk about the Lord, sometimes even to church folk, and you're excited about the things of God, you might not have ever experienced this before, but I know when the Lord got a hold of me, I was talking, I was talking to somebody about football on Sunday, and when the Lord got a hold of me, I was talking to him about Jesus on Thursday. And he was somebody that I've been rubbing shoulders with in the church forever. And he's like, dude, what happened to you? I'm like, I'm going to tell you what happened to me. Jesus got a hold of me, brother. Yeah. You know, and, and I'm not saying you can't ever talk about football, but 
If you're in love with him, I'm just saying at some point in time, he ought to become the topic of our conversation. Right. If we're passionate about him, you can't force it. But at some point in time, he ought to become the topic of our conversation. He turns around to the to another one and he spoke the same thing. And you know what the people answered him? The same thing that his brother said. <laughs> oh no. Something not right with you. Causing trouble. <clears throat> so they go and tell Saul. And Saul says to David, You can't go up against this Philistine to fight with him. You're just a youth. And he's a man of war. And look what David says. Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, came a lion and a bear, and took a lamb out of one of the flocks. I, I put these two scriptures here to remind you of something because I didn't get to the part in Numbers 14. I, I, I ended up missing it. But in Numbers 14, when we were just reading that, God reminded Moses that he had performed great signs among them and they still didn't believe. God does things in your life and in my life and he wants us to remember that. In Revelation 12, 11, it's talking about the end. It says, they overcame him by the blood of the lamb, the word of their testimony, and they loved not their own lives even unto death. What I'm trying to tell you is that young David right now is remembering what God has done in his life. Young David is remembering, no, what you don't understand, King, is that God has already done some things in my life. And I know that God will give me the victory again. Amen. Amen. <coughs> so let me just tell you real quick. The next thing they did was Saul tried to put his own armor on David. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I'm not, I can't see it, and it doesn't say it, but I imagine David, this little teenage boy, where, because Saul was big. The Bible says Saul was big. And I imagine his sleep is <laughs> long, and he's over there trying to put these. And you know what David says? I can't fight in this. This is not proven. This is not how I fight. This is not how I killed the lion. This is not how I killed the bear. Amen. The, the Lord has taught me how to war. Right. The way that the Lord wants me to war. There's a right way to war and a wrong way to war. And sometimes whenever people are trying to get us to do it their way, it's nothing but flesh. And the Lord is saying, follow me, trust me, and fight in the spirit. And all I can tell you is, is that I imagine young David, because I think he was just, this is what I imagine in my head. I think he was real coordinated. And I see him, he's popping down, boom, 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 boom. He's coming down into the valley, and then he's walking out. Goliath's way over there. The Philistines are way over there. Now they're in the valley. And, and David's walking, and he just softly, smoothly picks up a smooth stone, sticks it in his little shepherd's bag. He gets five of them. He sticks them in his shepherd's bag. But then when the time was right, you go back and you read the text. You remember how I said the men fled from the giant lady? Is it, I, and I just I don't know why, but I want him to be left-handed. I want him to be left-handed like a left-handed pitcher throwing these sick curveballs. And I see him loading up that sling. I can't prove it that he's left-handed. But I see him loading up that sling on a full-on run. And, and the Bible says that David, with haste, ran towards the Philistine. Oh, man, I got to feel the Holy Ghost on that. David, with haste, ran towards the Philistine. And I see him running and swinging, and when he released that rock, because you know what, you know what that, that Goliath told him? He said, how dare you come out at me with a shepherd's staff? He called it a stave. You come out here with a, with, a, with a shepherd's staff. How dare you come at me? You're nothing but a little boy. And the Bible says that he disdained it. He laughed at him. You know, you know what, this is something I thought I'll never be able to, I don't think I'll ever be able to prove it. Psalm 23 is a psalm of David. And I just thought this the other day when I was reading this, like three days ago. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. I imagine David at some point in time, as he's running towards that giant, at some point in time, that big old giant is blocking his sight. Mm -hmm. And he runs up in that shadow. That's good. Yep. And he's, and I, again, I can't prove it, but boy, isn't that a cool thought? <laughs> Amen? Isn't that a cool thought? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Goliath, Goliath said, who do you think you are, you ruddy little boy, you little red-headed, pretty little boy? Who do you think you are coming out against me? And David said, you come at me with spear and sword, but I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord. Amen. So what am I trying to say with all this? In two stories that we have where we encounter Nephilim, giants, God is wanting 
his people to trust him, to believe him for the victory. Amen. Because look, God wants me to get glory. Again, yeah. Yeah. I wish that I had, no, yeah. I don't wish because this is the word of God. That's I wish right. I could explain it right. God's purpose is that he would get glory <coughs> on earth. That's, right. That's why he'll use a little shepherd boy to kill a big old giant. That's why he'll use a Caleb. I didn't even get to share this part with you. But Moses, see, originally Joshua's name was Oshia in Numbers 13. I didn't stop. And, read. and you know what that means? That word Oshia means salvation. But then it says Moses called him Joshua. The Lord is salvation. So Caleb yeah. is walking with Joshua. The Lord is salvation. And he comes back. He's a type of a believer that's walking with Jesus. And he goes into the land. He says, yep, they got giants. They got giants over there. But I know that the God I serve has a plan. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. And I know it's his will to give us the victory. Because I know my God and he wants to get glory. And here we got the same story. Here's the young shepherd boy. And he's like, I know I'm coming at you in the name of the Lord. I done seen the Lord give victory whenever I thought there could be no victory. And I know God wants to give me victory over you. He said, today I'm going to feed you to the birds, my friend. He said, today I'm going to cut you. Your head will be removed. Boy, that was good. I had that highlighted to tell you. But I done went way well over. To connect the head. To connect the head to Genesis 3.15. Yeah. Oh, that's good. David didn't even have a sword. Well, we could preach about David's sword for 30 minutes. I'm not going to do it. I'm talking about Goliath's sword. We could preach about Goliath's sword for 30 minutes. But let me tell you something. That day after that rock planted in that giant's head, David ran over there, took his own sword, and cut his own head off. Severed that time. The head severed from the body. Because God is removing the power from the forces of evil. Come on. And as we move forward, I want you to know as we move forward and we see what, what, we're, what, we, what we're up against, what the children of Israel have been up against, what the early church was up against, what we're, gonna, what we're up against now, and what will be in the end of days, we got to be reminded. Yes. The Lord wants to give us the victory. Hallelujah. The Lord wants us to possess the land. The Lord wants us to advance for his purposes. Yes. This is not your best life now, my friend. Amen. <laughs> That's not this church. Sorry. They, they might, you might find it down the road. Right. But that's not this church. Amen. Because your best life is not now. That's right. That's right. Your best life is tomorrow. Amen. Your best life is in glory. Yeah. Right. Your best life is in eternity. Can oh. God heal today? You better believe it. Yeah. Can God restore? You better believe it. We got some people sitting up in here right now that have experienced resurrection life. Amen. 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 But hallelujah, this is not your best life now. It's in eternity. Amen. I know I've preached long, but does anybody have any questions that they want to ask? The, the tribe of Benjamin has 600 left handed. Yes, isn't that good stuff? That's where yes. I guess. 600 left handed <coughs> slingers. <laughs> what? Tribe of Benjamin. That was close to David, too. That was Saul's people. Well, fear in their hearts. Yeah. Fear in their No fear in their hearts? No, fear in their hearts. They got fear in their hearts. Oh, yeah. Anybody got any questions? No? That was good. Oh,